Okay. Well, I want to start by stating that the University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. It's an incredible honor to be hosting Valerie Segrist in today's program on the environment seminar. Valerie is an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot tribe who for more than a decade has worked at the intersection of nutrition, human health, and native food sovereignty. Her efforts in this area are based around education, awareness building, and helping tribal communities all over North America overcome barriers to accessing traditional, nutritionally appropriate and culturally relevant foods. Since earning a BA degree at Bastyr University and a master's at Antioch University, Valerie has gone on to work in the traditional foods and medicines program at Northwest Indian College. She later founded the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, and she has co-authored several publications, including the books Feeding the People, Feeding the Spirit, Revitalizing Northwest Coast Indian Food Culture, and Feeding Seven Generations, a Coast Salish Cookbook. Like many people here, I've been a huge admirer of Valerie's work for quite some time, and we are privileged to have you with us here today, Valerie. Um, I'm only sorry that we don't actually get to meet in person, but uh, with that, let's give Valerie a warm welcome and a warm virtual round of applause. So thank you so much, Valerie. And um, yeah, let's make sure we can get your slides up here. And uh, yeah, we're looking forward to this. Thanks, Tim. Can you see him? Yes. Yeah, that, that looks perfect, actually. That's great. Great. I love it when technology works for me. <laughs> That's good news. Um, well, I really appreciate the invitation and what a weird world we live in, um, but it's working. So <laughs> let's just go with it. Um, I wanted to, well, so today, because I know many of you are interested in food sovereignty, I'm going to talk about that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project and the what it all means and what we did and what's ongoing. Um, but then I wanted to get into some of the Northwest Native foods just to sort of share, you know, the both the ecological, the traditional ecological knowledge and the, uh, the scientific knowledge that really is helping to support the efforts of the reasons why food sovereignty is so important, um, but also not just uh, for, for Coast Salish people, for Muckleshoot people, but for all people that these are, uh, these are important lessons to be learned from the land. And I can't help myself. I just have to talk about the food. So, <laughs> so um, this is a very young Val who was just finishing her degree at Bastyr University in 2009. And, um, and I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to go to, it, it's a pre-med program. So I was really, you know, aiming for a naturopathic, um, uh, a, a, doc a doctorate's degree in naturopathic medicine, but I had a cup of nettle tea and I've written a, a lot of really obnoxious stories about it, but it changed my life. <laughs> and I went off on this wild foods parade. And I also knew that I couldn't be the kind of nutritionist that came back to my community and sat in a clinical setting and prescribed a diet to my community members that I knew they didn't have access to or had challenges and struggles accessing. And so instead, um, I decided to invest all my energy and you know career pathway into being a community nutritionist that really worked with my community members uh, building out strategies and positive interventions that helped increase access to traditional foods and strengthen our food culture. Um, and so that has taken me uh, in many different directions because when you're listening to your community and, and sort of trying to uh, organize their, their strategies on how to overcome these things, you just have to be adaptable <laughs> to what they're asking. And so what is food sovereignty? The, uh, the World Health Organization defines it as the right of peoples to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods. 
and their right to define their own food and agriculture systems. And um, I've been able, been fortunate enough after doing this for over a decade uh, to work on food sovereignty initiatives across the United States and now in Canada. And, um, and so there have been these sort of real unique perspectives, I think, on native food sovereignty or tribal communities really trying to exhibit and strengthen food sovereignty. And those include real, like a real basic breakdown of this sort of high level definition that the, the WHO has put out. But um, it's that a community exhibits tribal food sovereignty that has access to healthy, culturally appropriate food that are able to grow, gather, hunt, and fish in ways that are maintainable over the long term, that they just are also able to distribute foods in ways so that people get what they need to stay healthy and adequately compensate, of course, the people who provide the food, utilizing tribal treaty rights and upholding policies that ensure continued access to traditional foods. Um, these are uh, basically, you know, what we are saying is when we collectively choose to eat something, we are collectively exhibiting food sovereignty. And that means that if we all tomorrow wanted to like go down the cauliflower diet parade and go eat a bunch of cauliflower, guess what? There's going to be more cauliflower in the world that we have. It's actually a very age old American tradition, right? To vote with your dollar and that when we choose to eat something, we are actively choosing for that thing to return, but and to be in abundance. But we've been a little bit disconnected from a very critical piece of that food supply chain, which is where we are active in the growth or um, cultivation of that food. And so how do we get more involved? Like we aren't already manic, busy Americans. <laughs> We've got tons of things to do. Um, but how can we be involved and how can that actually transform our life instead of be this really transactional experience that I think many of us uh, have when we go to the grocery store and we buy a blueberry and then we pay for that thing and then we leave the store. It's a real transactional experience versus potentially growing that blueberry or going and harvesting it and then sharing it with someone who couldn't you know, harvest it because they didn't have the time off or the money to do it. That that's actually a transformational experience where we're part of a citizenship, where we're part of um, a community effort to feed people. And that it's our human innate design to be active in that way, especially in our food system, that we've never been this disconnected before in all of human history. And so um, food sovereignty has incredible potential to heal all of us, not just native communities, but I think all communities and all humans on the planet. So um, we started with, uh, so then how, how do I do this or what did it look like in Muckleshoot? We started first with a sort of a, a food resources map or like an inventory of what we had. And at the time I was really inspired by the green maps movement. Vashon Island at the time was doing this uh, very actively. They had uh, mapping stations set up at their farmer's market. People would come in and, and put their, like, their business on the map and say, I make soap or I make honey. And they were able to uh, create a resource map for their community that really showed, helped people navigate, I guess, where to go to buy local things and to support a local economy. And so um, I wanted to do, to do something similar in Muckleshoot where we didn't just talk about all of our deficiencies and all of the, like, uh, you know, Native people have experienced incredible um disruption of our, our usual and accustomed activities within our traditional food system, be it waves of pandemics that came through the land, which was a loss of uh, major population loss, like 85% of Coast Salish vill villages were wiped out uh, in the 1770 to 1830s. Then, you know, then came the uh, Donation Land Claims Act, which was a move by the federal government to swallow up the Northwest Territory before British Columbia did. So they were uh, encouraging people to come settle the lands of the Northwest before treaties were even negotiated. Then treaties were negotiated. Then boarding schools happened where for eight generations, 
Native kids were taken from their homes and, and their identity was stripped from them and their foods were taken away. All that cultural transmission was totally disrupted. And at that time, we experienced what was considered and still is considered a superimposition of a standard American diet, where for that many generations, uh, over the course of eight decades, our native children were fed army rations, which consisted of poor quality fats, refined carbohydrates and sugars, and that altered the taste buds of our culture. And so through fighting for treaty rights, through um, all of these, all of these overcoming all of these barriers and challenges, we're now in a position where we ha- we're seeing high rates of nutrition related uh, epidemics like diabetes and heart disease and inflammatory diseases and cancers. Diabetes didn't even exist here pre-contact. In fact, the first um, noted incidence was in the 1950s. So it's been less than a hundred years. It's not even in any, like the word diabetes is not in any indigenous language across the country because it didn't exist here and it's completely nutrition related. Um, And so anyways, for all these reasons, when we, when we were in this mode of just surviving for so long, now coming to a place where I believe we're, we have an opportunity to do some healing. It takes some really strong intention to think and, and hold space for a conversation that's focused on solutions and not just deficiencies. And so instead of talking about all the loss that we've had, which is true and right, we can't just stay there and need to move forward in thinking about how we can revitalize our food traditions, because we know that there are, there's ancient wisdom in that and that it is our medicine. And so the process of food sovereignty and bringing people along into those conversations is part of the healing and, and mapping our resources in this way was this profound kickoff moment where we had administrators and students and uh, elders and hunters and fishermen all coming together and saying, these are, this is where I go to get this food source. And this is where I go to get this food source, just to sort of see what we had intact then to also see where the gaps were that we could, you know, potentially help strengthen. And that's just uh, a way that like, we've always managed land. We've always looked at the human intervention piece to it and how we can help create abundance in our food system. And so that was the, the initial, the initial meeting and what we found, and actually this was really outdated, but what we found is that we, we did have a lot, but that it was really difficult to get to bash on Island to harvest clams. You had to have money. You had to be able to know how to catch a ferry. You had to be able to hike down a hill. And what if you're an elder who was handicapped and couldn't do it? You had to know how to, how to look for a clam show and, you know, dig at the right time. There was, there were all these, each one of these served up as an opportunity to be a curriculum. And that again, follows our traditional practices where the land is the curriculum. And so um, out of this came the, the like sort of next step and the guiding light in what, what we needed to do to be able to strengthen sovereignty, food sovereignty in our community. We developed an action plan out of it, looking at everything we had and said, our priorities, our three priorities to strengthen food sovereignty in our community were to increase access to traditional foods and local healthy foods. We wanted to acknowledge that we like cucumbers and <laughs> chard. <laughs> well, I do. And, and, uh, and that those are also local healthy foods that grow here. Um, and so we wanted to include that. And then also to really lift up knowledge sharing, to build outreach activities into everything we were doing to make sure we, we were raising awareness of these initiatives. And, and then also just take a real strong focus on education because that boarding school era and all this, like there's a lot of uh, media focus on this right now. The boarding school era is in my opinion, the darkest times of American history and, and for our history as well. I could not imagine having two young children. I couldn't imagine uh, what, what my ancestors went through. And, um, and we also saw that 
with so much need for education that we can transform classrooms into healing spaces. And that means taking kids outside and helping them to encouraging them to really experience the phenomenon in, of nature and to not feel shamed by, you know, being wrong by science or math or any of those things, but that, that when we had to uh, take an approach to education through food and through healing, that uh, we had the opportunity to really change our narrative and really um, heal our history. And so uh, a lot of curriculum has been built out of this. And I've, I never went into this thinking I was going to become a curriculum writer, but that's essentially all I've done for 10, 10 years now. And then um, cultivating community involvement, of course, like we did not want this to be the kind of movement where it was just me or some, you know, some beast out there that could easily just quit and walk away and the whole thing would be, would fold in on, on itself. We want to take every opportunity possible to lift up uh, anyone who wanted to be involved and just create a platform for them to share their gift and that we are all leaders and we are all big thinkers in this so that we, that food sovereignty will always exist. And it's not just, I just see that happen too often in movements where, you know, the, the leader will um, pass away or go away in some way and all the efforts are diminished. And so we really needed this to be baked into everything we were doing policies, procedures, departments, education, all of it. And so um, one of the initiatives that we, well, <laughs> one of the initiatives that we really talked about was the menu system. Um, and this is just an, an example of several projects that were um, supported with uh, grant funding and uh, the support of my community. But the cultural values and healthy food guidelines of the Muckleshoot Kitchens came out of a community-based research project where um, I did some math and realized that we have several community kitchens in our community and we're serving over about a thousand, yeah. over a thousand meals a day in our, um, uh -huh. okay. in, in our uh, community and that there are menu programs that go from our early learning facility all the way to our elders program. And that I knew if we were able to eat just one traditional foods meal a week, we would increase our blood nutrition value and that that had a potential for great healing. And in order to do, to do that, we met with all the cooks from all of the kitchens and asked them what they needed to exhibit food sovereignty and really offer healthy dishes that supported native foods in their community or in their kitchens. And so um, we all put our minds together. We brought in, they asked for training on the job from chefs. So I brought in native chefs from across the country. Chef Sean Sherman came in and Nephi Craig from the White Mountain Apache. Um, Chris Rodriguez, he actually used to work at UW as a chef and Chef Tom French, who has done incredible work on Whidbey Island and Vashon Island as well. Um, and they trained over the course of two years, they trained up all of our kitchen staff um, on how to work with healthy local foods, how to uh, order. And we were able to combine our purchases and, and hit higher tiers of better quality food from our food distributors because of it. Um, it just took a little bit of organizing. But we also put our heads together and with this big question of how cooks see themselves as health practitioners in our community, really built out these guidelines. And that is that all of our menu programs operate under these, that we will commit to a traditional food meal offered one day a week at least in Muckleshoot that now is like Thursdays at the tribal school. There's one traditional food on the menu, like berries for breakfast, salmon for lunch, or a halibut, or a, a bison um, burger, something that has a native food in it, wild rice stew, something like that. It doesn't have to be uh, particular to the Northwest, although that is the, um, the priority. We have also um, prioritized wholesome and fresh ingredients on the menu. Uh, they are local and seasonally inspired menus. They contain the highest quality of ingredients. So like, for example, we know the kids 
and the elders will eat, uh, they want ketchup, you know, on, <laughs> on their, on their menu. That's food sovereignty. That's cool. Eat the ketchup. But, um, we couldn't find, we couldn't get organic ketchup, uh, because it was not, uh, in demand enough for a food distributor. And it was this crazy, crazy amount of markup on it. But when we got all the kitchens to order ketchup from this one distributor, they were able to get it to us at a reasonable price. And we had this organic ketchup that now people, um, love and prefer. So we're, we're looking at, you know, instead of having products that are really heavy on processed foods or MSGs or, you know, all that stuff that we would take a stance on really trying to source the highest quality of ingredient and really work strongly with our food distributor to make sure to keep that mindset um, in helping us to make those selections. And then, of course, we wanted to support our uh, community food producers. And for us in Muckleshoot, we've got an incredible fisheries program that's um, that's actually located on First Avenue, the Muckleshoot Seafood Products Enterprise, and they purchase their fish from Muckleshoot fishermen, and the, that those fish now go to our kitchen and our casino. And so, just closing that loop, you know, keeping that dollar inside of our community and having that multiply on so many levels because it's increasing our health and nutrition. Um, that was a priority of our cooks. And they also got to see their purchasing power, um, which was pretty, pretty cool and uplifting, right? Again, going back to that voting with your tummy, uh, age old American tradition. And if you wanted to read more in-depth information about that, I actually wrote a report on it for First Nations Development Institute. It's on their website and it's called The Power of the Tribal Dollar. Um, it meant to be sort of like an a, a think tank idea of what one community, the impacts one community can make by just shifting and committing to these, uh, these principles that can also totally uphold food sovereignty efforts. Um, we've also been able to develop the uh, community food education curriculum, the Cedar Box Teaching Toolkit. This was co-developed with Muckleshoot tribal members in our territory. It, there is one at the Burke Museum. It's actually a cedar bentwood box that contains 13 quintessential native foods in it. And each food has a module that goes with it that can easily be aligned to next generation science standards or core concepts or anything within the state. There's a digital version available um, on the Office of Superintendent and Public Instruction website. And, um, and then again, if you wanted to actually check it out, you could go to the Burke Museum and check it, check out from their Burke boxes, um, the Cedar Box Teaching Toolkit and get the physical version of it. But we made 13 of these boxes and gifted them to tribes in our surrounding um, that we share treaties with. So the Medicine Creek and the Point Elliott Treaty uh, that's anywhere from Swinomish to Nisqually to Squaxin actually, we, we were able to share and gift each one of the communities with a box and invited them in for a three-day training session with, um, with me and some of the developers to expand and, you know, always support the ongoing efforts of what our, they're all our relatives <laughs> and we share these management responsibilities with them. And so whatever we can do to, to share that is part of our, our cultural um, protocols as well as to be generous and, and lift each other up. And so we uh, were able to distribute that to these other communities. I know the Suquamish Museum currently uses it for all their field trip and Squaxin has it uh, centered in their food system program as well. And Swinomish is using it. So um, we're trying to also, you know, uh, what do I want to say? Branch out, <laughs> I guess, spread out the, the knowledge and the initiatives. This I'm going to talk about in a minute. So I'm going to, I'm going to quit. I feel like it's getting really dark in my room. Sorry. Um, we also, did the healthy ancestral beverages toolkit and this came out of the no dapple movement actually where we were seeing a lot of this like mantra of water is life water is life and the nutritionist inside me was like yes and we should be drinking more of it <laughs> because the number one cause of um like you if you drink a sugary beverage a day you're 
rates of diabetes or uh, possibility of getting uh, diabetes over your lifetime increases by like 50%. It's crazy. And that we have these really rich beverage traditions in our in our um, community where we take plants and we infuse it in water and we drink that and it's like vitamins. And so we should be drinking more of our ancestral beverages and putting down the sugary beverages. So this is a curriculum toolkit that helps um, that we've actually trained up over 70 people to lead that um, helps you to set up a beverage station in a, like an, in a community setting or in an educational setting where you can uh, make some, a big pot of nettle tea or demonstrate huckleberry smoothies or uh, make a tea bar where people can actually blend their own tea and uh, just with a pot of hot water and then get all their vitamin C for the day. And then Bell sleeps at night. <laughs> so, so it's a really um, like hands-on user-friendly uh, curriculum. It's also available online at the First Nations um, Development Institute website, and also on the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board website, you can download the PDF version of it. And and again, I also come in and do trainings on that for um, for communities that want to to lift it up. And so, let's see. I'm. Do I have a hard stop at five thirty? Sorry, Tim. I could do this all night. So <laughs> just let me know. Um, yeah, the hard stop would be at 530. And um, it would be great to have a yeah, little bit of time for questions, um, you know, somewhat before that. So um, but, but yeah, we're, we're happy to this is fascinating. So um, feel free to keep sharing. Um, okay. But yeah, maybe maybe by five, certainly no later than 520. It'd be great to be able to take some questions maybe even a little bit before that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go fastest and I apologize. I don't have a light on in my room. It just got really dark out. So I'm like in the dark. Um, but anyways, you can look at this beautiful slideshow. So the gift of native foods, this is a, a slideshow that Elise Crone and I put together. She's, I call her my work wife very lovingly. She's um, her and I do everything together and I'm very grateful to have her in my life. She studied with Subie or Bruce Miller from Skokomish. And that is um, Bruce's little niece, Kimberly and my very fierce teacher, who's so beautiful and I love her very much. Um, and in the top right corner there, but this is a wild foods and medicines uh, module. And this is the presentation that goes with it. We've been using it um, to help train up tribal kitchens this summer to do the stuff that I just previously talked about. And so um, but we're doing it on Zoom, so that's fun. So anyways, this is just a brief overview of native foods and what I mean when I'm saying native foods. And, uh, and one of the things to, you know, we're really trying to help support is that, um, that we can gather wild foods and that these foods are, um, are waiting for you right outside your door. We actually have worked with the Alaska Native Health Consortium in the past, who's talked about there is a store outside your door and they have a really beautiful YouTube series as well, if you wanted to look it up but that our wild foods are so nutritious and so flavorful and that they thrive all around us. And it's a common saying that our foods are our greatest teachers. Uh, the plants are our greatest teachers and that they're waiting for us right outside the door. And that they're not teaching us like how I am today where I'm standing here telling you all I know about these foods, but they teach us as a uh, through being a living example. And we see that as Coast Salish people and think, how can we also live a life where the stories of our life are lessons for people and how do we carry ourselves in that way? And so that is sort of the, the tone of the next several slides, but, but that when we're also connecting with, uh, foods outside of our door that, um, which are considered like not just resources or commodities, they're our greatest teachers and our relatives, but they, um, they also help attune us to the seasons and the things that we need to get through seasonal change. Like right now, I'm seeing a lot of chanterelles, like winter chanterelles on the forest floor, right? And those are like these little orange flickers of um, 
density on the forest floor. They sort of catch your eye and they remind me of sunlight. And that makes sense because chanterelles are actually really high in vitamin D, which is something every Washingtonian needs, especially right now, getting through that seasonal change, we need that extra burst of the sunshine vitamin. And so the nature provides for us what we need to get us through that period of time. And that that's something to really be cherished and taken care of with great consideration. And so we can do that when we're actually more connected with wild foods, instead of thinking that we wreck them you know, wreck the environment every time we get into it. Um, and that food is a gift, that it's part of what connects us to our culture and our community and the land. And that when we're out there active on the landscape, harvesting our berries or medicines with good intention or pursuing living legacies like elk or deer or, or fishing our rivers and bays, that we're gifted with memories, both new and those of a distant past, and that that is our spiritual, physical, and mental medicine on every level it feeds us. And so food is actually a gift. It's a reminder that we're human and that we rely on foods to exist, to give their life for us to have life. And so what are native foods? We've got foods from the water, like Salmon, of course, um, lingcod is on my mind these days. I'm really hungry for that for some reason. Um, roe, chum salmon season is happening now. I think we're in the moon of the chum salmon. Actually, that's what the Coast Salish moon is called because we would organize our life around this fish run, right? So we named a whole entire moon cycle after it. Um, and that is like the most prized fish roe on the market. Um, seaweed, shellfish, clams, crab, prawns, sea mammals like whales and seals. Um, there are animal foods from the land. It's also hunting season. So I have several hunting families that I'm very proud of that are out active on the land right now, harvesting animals to come back and feed our community. And that's considered a great honor and helps bind us together as a people when we share one animal that's the ultimate manifestation of the forest, like, like elk, for example. Um, then lots of plant foods, um, berries, flowers, tree barks, like alder bark was actually part of, um, a recipe to make a, a certain type of bread, which actually took a lot of energy to make, um, to get that little source of starch in our diet, um, greens, nuts, mushrooms, plants below the ground, like, uh, camas, Camas prairies, chocolate lily bulbs, wapato, spring beauty, bitter root, mountain potato. There's so much. In fact, a study done by the Burke Museum's archaeologists created a database of over 300 different kinds of foods that were eaten in our territory pre-contact. That that is very different from a standard American diet, which is anywhere between 12 and 20 foods in a given year. And, um, and then also this idea of, of a cultural ecosystem. And so when Captain Vancouver sailed into the Puget Sound in the 1770s, he wrote that he had never seen a land so untouched by man before, untouched by the hand of man before. But what he didn't understand was that he was looking at a very well-maintained uh, uh, food system that consisted of food forests, uh, shellfish gardens that produced ample amounts of clams and oysters and seaweeds, uh, root prairies that were camas prairies existing from northern Canada into northern California. Um, we nowadays call it the I-5 corridor. <laughs> that was all a camas prairie that's now less than 3% of it is still intact, but that that prairie produced an incredible amount of food. And um, and huckleberry, uh, mountain huckleberry ecosystems, berry thickets, those things were all very well maintained. And we know that because they were, uh, there were methods of cultivation attending the land, which included selective harvesting, replanting, digging, tilling, weeding, sowing seeds, pruning, burning the landscape, all these interventions were meant to intentionally manage the land. And that without that, human intervention without humans being an integral part to the ecosystem instead of separate from it, observing it, we were actually and still are very active in it. And that we have the ability to be active and intervene in a way that promotes abundance and feeds people very well. And so while the Northwest was cited as the most densely populated non-agricultural region on the planet, 
pre-contact, it was actually an agricultural region. We just don't consider it that. We don't consider these forest gardens or these root prairies as like Mr. McGregor's garden. So they don't, qual they don't ca get categorized under agriculture, but anytime a person steps into nature and does something to increase the food system, that is an act of agriculture. And that is a major American paradigm shift that we all have to make so that we can see these lands in, in a different uh, perspective and through a different lens. Um, and so anyways, I could go on and on and on <laughs> about cultural ecosystems, um, but that there are also non-native plants that exist here that are edible. And so be asking yourself, what is a weed? And what are some like dandelions are considered weeds, but they're one of my favorite plants. I know like I'm that crazy neighbor that just moved into your, your neighborhood and I'm, I'm out there picking the dandelion flowers. <laughs> time because they're food and right now you can harvest the root and um and drink it as a tea or put it into cakes or whatever put it on your thanksgiving table it's so delicious and it's so good for you it can help regenerate liver cells in your body it's got a lot of nutrition in it it's high in iron and calcium and is really nutritious but we treat it like we're actually committing warfare on it in this country. You've, have you ever seen those roundup commercials where like sticking the hand in the screen and they spray the dandelion and it bursts into flames and screams and dies. And it's like, oh my God, that's food <laughs> that's been around for, you know, more millions of years watching the rise and fall of civilizations, the like extinction of dinosaurs on the planet. And it still managed to figure out a way to live here. And I think it probably has a lot to teach us about resiliency and how to last through time. And, uh, and it's also just incredibly nutritious food that's abundant everywhere. And so, uh, dandelions, is it a weed or is it a food? Um, Himalayan blackberries again, like they're everywhere. They're also a really good uh, food source. And I don't particularly like these ones because I, I am a seagrass and we have favorites apparently. And that's what people tell me, but, um, this one is not my favorite, but it's, I hear so many good, uh, memories and stories that people have standing around berry thickets that are blackberry bushes and harvesting and making pies with their, their grandmas. And that's beautiful. That's food tradition. And we should embrace it. Um, at the risk of like running out of a lot of time, I'm just going to briefly show this slide. So this is another poster that we created. It's available at chatwinbooks.com and it's, um, a, an interpretation on how we can all, uh, eat like the ancestors, like my, my mentor, Hank Gobin from Tulalip said, Val, this is great. I love it. How are we going to help our people when our usual and accustomed harvesting grounds are now Albertsons and Safeway? Like how do they get through the grocery store and bring their ancestors with them? And these are common themes that are just as applicable today as they were generations ago that Elise and I kept hearing being uh, through conversations with elders and native food experts around uh, what a traditional foods diet looks like. And so I'm just going to talk about a few of them, but living with the seasons um, getting in rhythm and sync with the seasons uh, and how for thousands of years, in fact, I just wrote an article, it's going to come out in Yes Magazine um, any day now about moons and the, the lunar cycle, that those lunar cycles were indicators that connected us to seasons. And this is a global shared history we all have. In the Northwest, it's the 13 moons and we've got they're very particular to Salal and Blackberry and Chum Salmon and all of those they're always named after, almost always named after a food. This is something that Vikings practice. This is something that there are, there's archaeological evidence dating back 13,000 years in Scotland from people who, who live their life on a lunar calendar, on a 13 moon calendar, instead of the 12-month Gregorian one that we know now that um, was just adopted like not a couple hundred years ago. It wasn't that long ago that we all shifted away from this very food system focused, um, seasonal focused lifestyle. But when we are living with the seasons, we become, we get the food at their peak nutrients and that helps to support our health. And that's really important to consider. To also diversify your diet. I talked about this a little bit already, but when you're eating 
with the seasons, you're also sort of kind of taking care of this one as well. But when you're eating a diversity of foods, you're actually also consuming different types and amounts of minerals and vitamins. And that also affects your health in beneficial ways. And that when we, re when we eat many types of foods, we receive nourishment that we need to stay strong. And so that also helps us to not buy into one monocrop system that we are, that it inadvertently is increasing food security because we're not just relying on one crop that may have, you know, a, a COVID de destruction on it. <laughs> who knows, right? Like last year, our food system, our food supply chain was nearly catastrophized by a pandemic. And we all have a lot to learn from that. But when we are, um, when we are investing in a diversity of nutrients, we are also choosing to not, not buy into just 12 to 20 different kinds of foods. It's important to um, have an array of foods. The nutrition, this is a, a very detailed, <laughs> detailed, geeky nutrition chart that I worked on um, with some uh, colleagues at Best Year around um, the differences and analysis of what a wild foods, uh, like one cup of nettles versus one cup of spinach. And so if you look over here, it says RDA, the recommended dietary allowance, let's just look at calcium. 800 milligrams a day is what's recommended by the USDA. And one cup of spinach is a hundred uh, milligrams of calcium versus one cup of nettle, which is like 2,900 milligrams of calcium. So the point here is that like wild foods, um, cultivated foods are beautiful and great. And they are also like have been doted on and like really tended to. And so they didn't have to create the same amount of nutrition and medicine to stand up to the different types of seasons or weather changes and patterns. And because of that, they're just not as nutrient dense, but this is also a good point to make because you don't need a whole lot of wild foods, just a little bit. Like, can you even just imagine what would happen to Popeye if he ate nettles, he would like lose his mind. He would like shoot into outer space. Like spinach is nothing on nettles. And so he wouldn't need a whole can. He'd just need a little bit and he could do amazing things with his life. Um, and so this is like, look at dandelion leaves, same thing. Like so, so much more nutrition in a dandelion leaf. Um, Anyways, I'll stop talking crap about other wild greens <laughs> or other leafy greens, but they're also nutrient dense in this, in this point too. So 10 small steamed clams is equivalent to 44 hot dogs. That's the amount of iron that you would get out of just 10 clams versus 44 hot dogs. So our common diet is not, is stuffing us, but starving us because we're not actually getting nutrition or, or nutrients that we need out of the food to be able to sustain our life. Um, this is a teaching that you have to try these things at least six times before you judge them. And, uh, and that's important because like Bruce would say, it actually takes that amount of time for your taste buds to be altered and to, you know, familiarize yourself with the different flavors of our native foods or different types of foods in general. And this is probably the one principle that all nutritionists will agree on and sweet um, son of the food, food movement, Michael Pollan has stated so eloquently that we have to eat food, not too much and mostly plants. And that we all agree that we should just be eating more plants. Um, and for example, these mineral rich dark greens, like one cup of nettles, is equivalent and the Elise loves this slide because she has a real issue with iceberg lettuce, <laughs> but I won't go there. Um, one cup of nettles, you would have to eat four and a half heads of iceberg lettuce to get the same, the same amount of, uh, of calcium. So, uh, if you were to have one cup of berries, you would have to eat 72 granola bars to get the same amount of vitamin C and fiber. So that's crazy. So again, like just eating your whole foods are going to help you, um, to get more nutrition out of the foods that you eat, but also they help feed you to make you feel full. I think it's like an innate human desire that our body and all of its wisdom 
desires wholeness so that we can feel whole. It's why we want to be part of a community and have a sense of belonging that we, that reflects those patterns reflect in the foods that we eat. And so, um, whole foods feed the wholeness inside of us. And uh, I like to say like, quite simply, I don't know of any like rivers of diet soda or shrubs of lucky charms or fields of marshmallows. Those things just like don't exist in nature. They're not whole foods. And they're really like, you don't need a scientific degree to understand what's in your food. If you're eating whole foods They're they consist of one ingredient, a blueberry is a blueberry. It's a blueberry. It's really simple. And that when you're eating that whole food, you are getting all of the, all of the benefits. I'm running out of time. So again, I just said that, oh, darn it. I busted it. This is all the ingredients. <laughs> Usually if I had time, I'd ask you to guess the ingredient and then I accidentally hit it already. But you, so I'd have people read this and then you'd have to guess what it is. And it's Doritos. Um, and then there's this one. And if I had time, I'd say, what do you think it is? <laughs> but it is granola bars. That is a lot of ingredients to have in a food when you could just go eat a whole food. So anyways, I'm going to end it on this slide. So we have time to talk, um, but try to build yourself some, like this is a season for nutrient dense snacks. Um, in our wild foods module, we are focusing on building out snack, uh, healthy snack alternatives. And my favorite thing to do is make, um, my own trail mix and, you know, you can simply put together a Northwest trail mix that is inspired by the ingredients of our land using things like hazelnuts and dried cranberries and dried blueberries. Um, and then I selfishly put some flower seeds in there cause it's my favorite and then mix it with some like cinnamon and I can eat that day and night and my kids love it. Um, but when you're making those things on your own and sort of just, in, that's your, the easiest low hanging fruit to be able to just incorporate into your diet is just, uh, making a healthy snack mix that emulates Northwest ingredients. And then boom, there you go. You've got your, you've got your traditional food key to the season. Um, and then in the, in the springtime, it would be like wild greens looking at dandelion leaf. It's the, one of the first greens to come out and um, is incredibly nutritious. It's bitter, but tender during that season and will help you to build your strength and stamina to be able to live out all your dreams that you've been visioning for yourself during your wintertime slumber. Um, and then in the summertime, we're usually looking at berries, right? <laughs> like that's, that's the seasons. So um, just I hope this is helpful and provides a little bit of context to what I mean when I say we're trying to increase access to, to traditional foods. These are the types of foods we're looking at and the teachings that we're trying to bestow, not folding into our modern day lives, but also passing that on to the next generation and doing it in really cool ways that are creating really positive interventions. I'll say one last thing. Um, because it's not covered in the food sovereignty slides, but I did go on to um, incorporate the teachings of the Cedar Box Toolkit and, uh, and some of the 10 gather grow stuff into our tribal school. And we saw an increase along with like uh, a good response to intervention structure for our, our K-12 curriculum. And we saw an increase of, um, of uh, an average of like in the 50% to up to 93% uh, in just a matter of four years of graduation rates rising. And so what we're finding is like our kids in this media world and technology world that we're living in are so hungry for these teachings because they ground us in a sense of identity when you're questioning who you are <laughs> in the world at a very young age and getting them outside of the four classroom walls like not staring at black and white, but learning to read the land, like how our ancestors did not that long ago, that it was our first form of literacy to be able to read the landscape and get to know these plants has empowered them in so many profound ways that they feel that, that this is applied practice in their life 
and, uh, and really love are learning to love learning and, um, and science and see themselves as engineers and mathematicians as well through food curriculum. So I really believe in this stuff. I think I've seen it in my own community. I feel really honored to be able to witness that and, um, and want to help support, you know, the whole world to be able to do this stuff. Cause I think we all need it, especially now. So I'm going to stop sharing and we've got some time, a couple of minutes for questions. Um, and yeah, thank you all. I'm just going to go turn my light on really quick. Okay. I'm listening to you. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, Valerie. That was incredibly inspirational and your work is so important. Um, I'm sure there's a few questions here. So as soon as you come back, let's, uh, let's see. It looks like I, Karina, are you raising your hand or clapping? Um, that was a clap. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Alicia, are you um, wanting to ask a question? Okay, great. So um, we've got a question here from Alicia Foster. Go ahead, Alicia. Um, so I noticed that while you were talking, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, my roommate is typing a test. I will type this out in the chat. <laughs> Um, okay, well, let's wait for her to type that out. And then uh, if there are other questions, let's see here. Well, let's, we'll just wait a couple seconds, but yeah, make sure you're thinking about other questions and uh, we'll be sure to get a few more folks here after Alicia. You're welcome to put your questions in the chat and maybe we can get them one by one. Um, I, I, Tim, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Sean. Oh, yeah, I, I have a question if, while we're waiting. Uh, really, I really appreciated your, your presentation, Valerie. It was really interesting. I, I find this a fascinating topic. I, I'm wondering, you know, you, you talked about these programs that you put into place with your, your uh, food kitchens uh, and, and making these traditional foods more available. Uh, I wonder if you could speak for a second about what the response has been within the community to this opportunity, uh, how folks have responded, not just from the standpoint of having these things, but how, uh, I, I guess, from sort of a, a well-being of the community, how, how have you noticed anything specific there? Hmm. I have noticed a range of things. So we had um, we had one student that we trained up to, to be the um, instructor on how to do earthen ovens because we wanted to revive also um, cooking practices. And so we had someone from Canada come down and train him on how to do this. And um, he was, he's a war veteran and was taking um, a, several different varieties of PTSD medication. And he was saying, and still says to this day, he no longer needs to take that because he has this cultural sort of ceremony in this practice where he has to really focus on being in a good um, state of mind and harvesting the rocks and preparing for the, the instruction um, has actually helped him find a, a way to, you know, connect in that, in that healing capacity. But I've also had people who are like, are really angry with me. <laughs> so <laughs> like when I, and I say this, like quite honestly, because I think I, I, when I first came out um, of my nutrition degree and started doing this work, I wanted to like, I got, I was the, my first job was um, managing the kitchen at the tribal school and I changed the menu completely and people freaked out. Like, especially it wasn't the kids, it was the adults that freaked out. Um, and I would get these like hate emails in all caps, like you're starving our kids. They're never going to eat this stuff. And so my lesson is, you know, to meet people where they're at. Like I have, and I still have goals that aren't on the menus for my community. And that will happen in my lifetime, I believe, or 
maybe in my children's lifetime, but, um, but people just weren't ready for it. However, a couple years ago, like 10 years later, I was sitting next to this, like my loudest and proudest email, um, keyboard courage member <laughs> who, uh, sat down next to me and we were eating a melon salad where we rolled in, um, wood sorrel. And we had the kindergartners go harvest that sorrel for the, the meal. And her grandson was one of the kids that harvested it. And he was so excited to tell her about it and have her try it. And she was like, she apologized to me and was like, I am so sorry. Like I just experienced this amazing thing with my grandchild and I get it now. So, you know, change is difficult. And if it, if it were easy, it would have been done. Um, but also being patient with people is so important. So yes, there's a whole range of how people have um, accepted it and not accepted it, but eventually accepted. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think Alicia's question is here in the chat now, if you want to take a look at that. Yeah. Um, I noticed you talked about native foods in two ways individually as a certain plant animal with discrete nutrients and calories, but then also as a larger practice, having diverse foods, not monocropping, eating what grows locally and seasonally, et cetera. So my question is, do you think that a native food like salmon could become a non-native by how it is treated? And could something like non-native like wheat become a native food by how it is treated and incorporated into food systems? That's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. So we do have like introduced salmon species, right? <laughs> like the net pen issue in our region. And there have been some, um, there's always like elements of systems of feeling alarmed by that, by that change. Uh, dandelion, for example, you know, it, it uh, got here before the pioneers did. <laughs> Actually, it showed up before uh, the changes in the Northwest and people saw that and immediately adapted it into herbal apothecaries. But because science tells us and history tells us it wasn't native here, it's not classified as native, even though we eat it. And so I think um, when foods can be introduced in a way that isn't harmful to the environment and as a, and is a benefit that um, I, I don't know if like I would have the power to deem it a native food, but that we should really strongly consider in including that in our diet. And that that is like this idea of conservation where we're, where we're conserving the commons and keeping it up to date, but our ancestors and our humans and humankind are innovative. We've always been innovative. And so how do we use our, like our beautiful minds in a way that helps to not cause harm, but increase the health of the land and the water and the people. And so um, if we can do that in a way that's a genius and innovative, which I believe we can, I don't, I don't know if native and non-native is really, um, is really as important as how well it treats uh, all of the living things. And then also how do you bring your teaching into communities where there might be a lot of concrete or toxins in the soil that prevent a healthy relationship with the land. I think that's really important to talk about. And there are several challenges to accessing food and healthy food. That is what food sovereignty is all about. It could be a loss of land. It could be a loss of rights. It could be a loss of knowledge. And it could also be environmental toxins. That's real. And we should all be upset if we're, if we're trying to you know, live a life of dignity and eat good food. And we can't because we have some corporate entity that's polluting our rivers or air, that that is our common responsibility to take care of and advocate for the things that don't have a voice like the salmon and our most foods <laughs> don't actually speak, um, that we have to be good friends to, to that and the land. And that is a, that is an, a human right. It's our right to eat, uh, clean food. And so, I often will tell people, be aware of your surroundings. Don't harvest from like ditches or roadsides. <laughs> That's like the scariest thing. I saw somebody on the side of the I-5 once harvesting beach peas and I lost my mind. Um, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, 
but it also causes us to practice the art of noticing, which is a step away from being mindful and, and, and involved in a system of reciprocity. And that's really what we're after here is a reciprocal relationship with our foods. And so being aware of that is really important. Um, and if you can't eat foods from a healthy place, then that's a human right issue. So we're at about 536 here and Valerie, I want to be cognizant of your time. Um, it looks like there's still plenty of folks who are interested in hearing about what you have to say. And maybe there's a few more questions, but do let us know, Valerie, if you need to head out. Um, but if, if not, I, I think I'd be, I'd be happy to stay for a bit longer and, and, uh, uh, continue a little bit of conversation, but let us know. Yeah, no, I've got, I've got time. If anyone has any other questions, I'm sorry to go so over and thank you for staying around. <laughs> no, it was wonderful. Um, I, I think what you presented was just perfect. So, um, but yeah, let's get a few more questions. If there are folks here, uh, Jeffrey, I see your hand there. Hi Valerie. Thanks so much for speaking with us tonight. Um, as you were sharing about the importance of sort of connecting to local food sources and, and the health benefits of some of the foods you mentioned, it, it brought to mind conversation, I think has come up um, previously in this class. And then I feel like might've also been, I think I heard your talk on the All My Relations podcast, and it might've come up there too about, um, you know, shifts in behavior have the potential to happen much faster than shifts in the capacity of the system to provide those foods. And especially when we have like you talked about with the chemist field, sort of restricted the, the availability of some of these food sources to grow or be produced. And it puts more stress potentially on um, the, uh, the stewards of the land who are growing these foods. And so thinking about, you know, if a big surge in popularity of certain foods then takes away availability of those foods to people who do have a longstanding connection to those foods, um, I guess just any, any thoughts on sort of a surge in popularity then how pricing or um, restricting availability and, and sort of how, how this all grows in a way that everyone is able to continue accessing those foods. Yeah, no, I, that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It totally does. And it is like, it is the risk of what, of, of this platform, I think. Um, I'm not trying to over romanticize the, the foods, but I also, um, for a long time, it has served native people to be really quiet and private with our culture for very real reasons, like people being put in jail for practicing potlatches, which are about honoring food. So, um, our culture has been taught over several generations to, uh, keep it secret. And we're in a time now with this like access to knowledge everybody has, you know, um, via World Wide Web and social media, where if we don't fly a flag saying like we eat these things and they matter to us and this is why, um, then we continue to promote invisibility, which is the the perpetuation of colonization. That's like the reason for it, right? And so we have to like I'm erring on the side of needing to explain why these are really important foods and they should be valued. And I'd rather have a movement, you know, uh, looking at, at these wild foods in that way than looking at them as resources to be extracted from the land and pushed into some capital capitalistic model. But also these things are cultivated, right? Like we could grow, you can grow raspberries and blueberries and camas and wild onions. Like you can just throw seeds right outside your door and they're native plants. They like to be neglected, which is great for me. Cause I'm a really lazy gardener, <laughs> but like that, you know, marrying that idea of putting them in your garden and cultivating more of these native foods for your own space is also a great way to say like, that, that we weren't just stumbling around out there harvesting, that they were, they were managed and planted with intention. And we can do that still too. So if we're going to be eating them, we also have to be considering that reciprocal relationship and also cultivating them in some way, hopefully, um, way, shape or form. And so I, 
Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, when I first started doing this work again, my elders were like, what are you doing? We never tell people that (laughs) horsetail is high in minerals, but after like there are, there's knowledge that I treat these foods like they're my best friends. So I would never tell everyone all the secrets I know about my best friend, but there's family knowledge about that best friend. And then there's like community knowledge and public knowledge about her. And so I feel comfortable talking in the public space of, you know, of this, um, around these foods so that, yeah, there, there is still secret knowledge. There is still stuff that I, about nettles, I would never, uh, never share with anybody else, but maybe my daughters someday. Um, and I, I, yeah, I guess I hope that gets at it, but I, like, if we're going to move this, this way, it's going to happen inevitably. And we should all just be, um, understanding that we, that, that these are things that need to be cherished. That will be so helpful. Thanks for that question. That was good. Valerie, I was wondering if I could follow up on that. Um, is Muckleshoot working with any state and federal agencies to help sort of regain access to management of traditional foods on state or federal land? And I, I guess, yeah, has, has there been any co-management happening? Have there been any challenges or maybe resistance to things like bringing back burning practices or uh, mm-hmm. uh, planting, tilling, um, all, all of those things that were traditionally done in these traditional places? Yeah. Um, so Muckleshoot does do a lot, actually. I think our our last budget was like over, it was well over $10 million just to go towards salmon habitat and hatchery systems to, you know, make sure that salmon return. Um, we work, we have one of the most intense uh, wildlife management programs that helps to monitor deer and elk and their health and habitats. Um, Even all the way to the east side, we're involved in conversations around maintaining high mountain sheep or rams and um, and the plight of their pneumonia and their situation with all of that. Um, And we do have an understanding now where if lightning were to strike, (laughs) that we would that. Well, and it used to be that. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that because it might have changed given the tone of wildfires. What I do know is our, um, our tribe has recently purchased in the last like six years, um, just over a hundred thousand acres of previously owned warehouse or forest land. And we are working really closely with Hancock uh, forest management to develop, uh, programs that lead to natural resource career pathways with our, with our, um, community members and have also like, I've been involved in designing, um, the replanting of the forest floor that includes more flame retardant type seed species like um, salal and sword fern and Oregon grape, like those things actually keep the intensity of fire heat down. And so we're replanting the forest floor with things like that when we are managing um, the property. And um, but it used to be that if there were a lightning strike in a huckleberry meadow, they wouldn't move as fast to put it out because Smokey the bear has done a really good job at <laughs> promoting, um, you know, fighting against wildfires. And now it's so out of control that I don't think that stands. I think they just try to get in there and take care of it as, as fast as possible. Yeah. I mean, that's tricky because some of the low elevation huckleberry balds actually need the fire, the fire regime to maintain them. So if you're hoping to harvest huckleberry in large quantities, you, you kind of need this really hands-on management. Um, but I, I mean, yeah, I, I can see the, I mean, the, yeah, it raises some potential conflicts there. Oh yeah. Um, so of course, Salal and uh, Oregon grape make uh are wonderful berries as well. Exactly. So, yeah, uh, it's another food source. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, for for me, I well, anyway, yeah, I, I would love to talk to you more about this, but uh, we <laughs> we we use salal berries a lot in my family, and I, I think they're underappreciated. Um, so, so underappreciated, yeah. aren't they delicious? 
Yeah, and and they're wonderful for baking, um, for for you know making muffins and pancakes and all kinds of stuff like that. So. Yeah, we have an entire moon named after Salal. The moon of Salal, I think, is like late July, August time. And it uh, it's so low in water content. It's really easy to dry and make Salal fruit leather out of, things like that. Um, but you can also grow it, right? So easy to just put like put a hedgerow in your front lawn. Yeah, that, that's exactly what we have in, in my nice. front yard, actually. Um, yeah, a very productive all right. Uh, well, let's see. Are there any other questions here? Uh, you, you're good, Alicia. Okay, great. Alicia, thank you for your question. It's really good. Yeah. I wanna, I, 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 go ahead, Gary. This is Gary. Um, you know, the you talked a lot about, this was great. In part, we've had a lot of really good speakers, I think. I'm not sure I laughed more at any of the presentations. <laughs> And that connects to the question I want to ask, actually, which I think is one that's relevant for our students. A lot of them are people who want to help make some of the kinds of changes that you helped make and that you've been so effective at bringing about. Could you talk a little bit about your people skills? You know, yeah. what do you think has helped, no, what do you, you clearly have it. What has helped most in really getting communities to work together and all of that? What, what parts of your personality and demeanor do you think have been of value to you in doing that? Oh man, I, I mean, I'm kind of selfish cause I love this stuff. And so I think it's really fun and I think we should all have fun doing it. You know, that there's, um, humor is an element to resilience. And when we can, uh, you know, acknowledge that this is like terrible history and we've, uh, we are so flawed. Um, but when we acknowledge that we can actually, uh, use it to inform our, our base and people who are interested in it. And, and it should be fun. This should be a healing process and, and we should look forward to it and revel in the opportunity, like the enviable opportunity that we have to repair this damage and to be able to pass on something beautiful to the next generation. That is so thrilling to me to be able to, to do that. I, I, and, and know that like, um, our ancestors did not always have a good life. They did not, like, no matter what history you come from, we all have, you know, a traumatic story to tell. And, um, they don't want us to be sad. <laughs> they don't want us to live, you know, in, in such misery and all the time. And, uh, I don't think that anybody wishes that we don't wake up wishing that for people. It's just why humans are inherently good. And, uh, and that's why the, you know, evening news is so shocking to us. Like, oh my gosh, people are doing terrible things. Like they play on that. And we live in such a toxic world, man. Facebook and all that stuff is just so toxic. I can't even bear to look at it right now. <laughs> um, and so anyways, we, you know, creating a warm and welcoming environment, holding space in that way is something that people really need. I think now more than ever. And the land is is such a great muse for that. Um, the waters are, the food is so having fun. And, and that's also an, a, one of the principles I didn't get to talk about was to eat and, um, uh, to cook and eat with good intention. And, uh, and that, you know, sort of mindful practice of, of holding good space and thinking about how you want people to feel when they eat your food or use your medicine. And that can also be like, you know, if you're going to hold a, a class or a workshop or something or an initiative to be like meditate on how you want people to feel when they're there, that you want them to leave feeling inspired and um, charged up and, and memories because they laughed and had a good time. And I think we all feel that. And I'm just silly. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> um. Val, I've got one more quick, hopefully, well, it's actually a big question, but you can give me the 30 second answer. I definitely want to be cognizant of your time. What, what have you learned in up there in Canada? And I mean, how are they doing in regards to the food sovereignty movement amongst the First Nations up there? Do um, you have any insight into that? I have been doing um, curriculum 
work across the border in various capacities, like that native infusion curriculum, actually, we cha- we trained up a couple of communities here, and then they had some suggestions that like totally changed the game of our curriculum. So again, that co like co-developing is so important. Like collaboration is hard, but it's so worth it because you go far, you know? Um, and so they've been doing some really cool stuff for a while. Um, I think feasting for change, it might've just changed the title of the curriculum because there's a huge truth and reconciliation act happening in the country where they, the government has made a lot of investment into research, trying to figure out how they can reconcile with um, the history of the first nations people, which is why you're seeing like part of it is demanding the records from the Catholic church to, uh, to see what, you know, happened in boarding schools here. And that's why you're seeing more media focus on it. But, um, part of that has also been like giving, uh, acknowledgement of the territory to the people because it's weird. I'm trying, I'm still trying to figure this piece out, but somehow we have to talk to the queen or whatever to like do the like Commonwealth or the crown uh, lands up here. (laughs) And so it's really an interesting step where I didn't realize how much um, British Columbia was really still steeped in that, that Royal, Royal life, I guess. And, uh, and so the tribes have now equal, like footing supposedly in their negotiations with land use. And um, I think because of that, there's a little bit of retraction right now on knowledge and how to hold it. And they're really trying to think strategically around that messaging of like, we've been here for a long time maintaining the commons and, um, and we want access to that. So it's ramping up though. It's, I, I might be slighted because I just spent the last two years working for the Native American Agriculture Fund and I see the like tremendous wealth that native and opportunity that native people have to produce food in the US. And I'm not seeing the same thing here. Um, They're like in that regard, a little bit behind what we're doing, but really trying to like dial up the volume and, and move forward, which is really cool. All right. Well, um, are there any other quick questions? I, I think we should probably uh, wrap this up. You've been speaking for a long time, Valerie. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah. It's been fascinating. I, I hope that we can bring you to campus at some point and meet you in person. Um, are, are you a UW PhD student or did I I am on a long break. Oh my gosh. I got to get back. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll be a good excuse. Um, (laughs) So, Uh, I know I'm in the college of built environment and, um, and was recruited in there to think about food policy stuff, but I'm not sure. Yeah. I had two kids and took a break and haven't come back. So I really need to get back in the game. Okay. Yeah. All right.